reading this morning comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 1 through 14. This is out of the New International Version of Scripture. Christ's sacrifice, once for all. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sin. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, Here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the blood body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices. Which, he, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. These are the scriptures revealing the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. <coughs> In England, there's a, a path called the Pilgrim's Way. Now, the Pilgrim's Way is one of many footpaths that go out throughout England, but this one's unique. It's unique in that it was the path that Christians for hundreds and hundreds of years took as a pilgrimage. For some, it's a way to do penance, and for others, well, it's a special time with it that they can use to concentrate on their relationship with God and deepen their spiritual walk. The trail, it ends at the... Uh, Canterbury Cathedral, where Christians completed their pilgrimage by kneeling in the spot where Thomas Becket was killed by the Knights of King Henry II. Now, the story behind Becket's death is that he was a close friend of King Henry II. And King Henry II appointed him to his court. Well, when the position of Archbishop of Canterbury opened up, Henry, he placed Thomas Becket in that position thinking that by having his friend there, his friend would always do his bidding. But something amazing happened. Something really amazing happened to Becket after he was appointed as the spiritual leader of England. He stopped being complacent about his faith. He put out he, he, he put politics and luxury behind him. He gave up his former wealth and his style of life completely. And to his peril, he began to oppose the king when it came to differences between the church and government. He paid the ultimate sacrifice. But Beckett's willingness to be a martyr for the faith it did not earn him a place in heaven. 
Neither did the pilgrimage to the site. Great though it may, it may have been for others, uh, many of those Christians. As difficult it may have been for them, it didn't earn them any merit points with God or any celestial favors. See, brothers and sisters, the whole point, the whole point of the Christian faith is that we could never earn our salvation no matter how hard we worked at it. No matter what great sacrifice we could make, even if we gave our bodies to be burned for the love of Christ, it would not make, one, make us one bit more worthy of heaven. We could crawl to Jerusalem on our hands and knees through broken glass the whole way. And it wouldn't make us one bit more worthy of heaven. There is only one way. One way that our sins can be taken away. Only one sacrifice sufficient to atone for our sins. It's the perfect sacrifice of Christ. Nothing else will do. The perfect sacrifice of Christ and this sacrifice, this sacrifice makes any other sacrifices completely unnecessary. The first point I'd like to bring up this morning is Jesus' sacrifice was the perfect sacrifice because he was one of us. He was one of us. In the Old Testament times, God told people to sacrifice animals as a temporary temporary covering for their sins. There's a temporary plan for, for the perfect sacrifice that was coming. As they confessed their sins and laid their hands on the head of the animal which was to be sacrificed, they understood that something else was dying in their place. They also understood that they themselves deserved to die. But God was providing a substitute. This sacrificial lamb, brothers and sisters, was to be a picture of the perfect lamb of God. This perfect lamb who would come. After the lamb was sacrificed on the altar, the person who offered the lamb would take it home and the whole family would eat the lamb in a sacrificial feast. <coughs> The sacrifice would actually become a part of them. The sins of the people in the Old Testament times were covered as they looked forward to the perfect sacrifice that was coming. Our sins, our sins have been taken away as we look back to the perfect sacrifice of Christ Jesus. We're here today to confess our sins and to have them placed on the head of the one who was our substitute and sacrifice. Because he died in our place and was offered as a sacrifice for our sins. We, because of this, we partake in his, his body and his blood as we receive the wine and the bread of communion. And as we ingest it, it becomes part of us. And now when God sees us, he sees the sacrifice of Christ. We do not come depending on our own ability to make a worthy sacrifice. We know that's impossible. We come depending, completely dependent, only on the sacrifice of Christ. The sacrifice of animals could never take away our sins except as they were representations of the true and perfect sacrifice of the Lamb of God. An animal cannot take away human sins. The perfect sacrifice had to be one of us. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, 
by the same sacrifice repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. <coughs> Excuse me. An animal sacrifice, no matter how perfect the animal was, would not do for human sin. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews uh, chapter 2, verse 17, For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Now the second point that I'd like to make this morning is that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice because he himself was sinless. He was sinless. See, there's a problem with priests offering sacrifices for the sins of the people. They're sinners. Just like the rest of the people. Before they could offer sacrifices for anybody else's sins, they had to offer sacrifices for their own sins. <clears throat> they were human like the rest. But how can one sinner atone for the sins of another sinner. That's why I cannot atone for my own sin. No matter how great a sacrifice, because I'm a sinner. A sinful person cannot do something that can take away sin. That what we needed was someone who was who was a part of the human race but one who is also totally sinless. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, the prospect looked hopeless for a very long time. No one could fill this requirement. But God had a plan. God had a perfect plan. He himself would come to us as one of us and then sacrifice himself for us. And in doing this, he would do something that no one else was able to do. <clears throat> he would become both the priest who would offer the sacrifice and also become the sacrifice himself. If you could be good enough to get into heaven on your own, then Christ died for nothing, didn't he? I mean, if you could make a sacrifice sufficient to earn your eternal life, then the sacrifice of Christ was totally irrelevant. That's what it's, that's what's meant by when the Bible says in Hebrews 10, 12, but when this priest offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. He sat down because his work was complete. He was able to do this because he was sinless. The Bible says, but we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. <clears throat> also, it says, unlike other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. This brings me to my third and last point. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice because he was deathless. He was deathless. <clears throat> There's one great problem with the Old Testament sacrifice system. When the lamb was sacrificed, it died. To be sure, it died in place of the one who had sinned and deserved to die according to the law, but it could not continue to be a sacrifice for that person after its death, right? 
But Jesus Christ is alive. He is able to continually be our living sacrifice before God. The Bible says in Hebrews 7, 23, 26, Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest meets our needs. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. During, uh, <clears throat> during Napoleon's Austrian campaign, his army advanced within six miles of Feldkirch, a beautiful little village nestled in the mountains of Austria. And it looked as though Bonaparte's men were to take this little unprotected town without resistance. But as Napoleon's army advanced towards their objective during the night, the Christians there, they, they gathered in this little church to pray. It was a Saturday night before Easter. And at sunrise, the bells of the, of the village peeled across the countryside. Napoleon's army, not realizing that it was Easter Sunday, thought the Austrian army had moved into Belkirch. And during the, you know, during the night, and that the bells were ringing in jubilation. <coughs> so Napoleon ordered a hasty retreat. And the bat Battle of Belkirk never took place. The Easter bells caused the enemy to retreat and peace reigned in the Austrian countryside. Brothers and sisters, what a wonderful God we have who has put our spiritual enemy in retreat and has given us spiritual peace because of the resurrection of Christ. He always lives to intercede for us. Always. Always. And because he lives, our spiritual enemy has not only been retreated, he's been totally defeated. We come here to, today to eat the sacrificial meal of our perfect sacrifice who is alive and here with us. Amen and amen.